Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Plant Breeders' Rights. My name is Laura Trentini, and I'm from the Strategic Communication Team at IP Australia. Before we begin, I'd like to start with a bit of housekeeping. A copy of today's slides is available for download from the control panel. We will have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end of the presentation, and we welcome you to submit your questions at any stage using the question box. Now that housekeeping is out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Andrew Hallinan. Andrew has been a PBR examiner for five and a half years and has been working in horticulture since the early 90s, working across most areas of amenity horticulture and some production horticulture in Australia and the US. When you submit a plant breeders' rights application to IP Australia, the plant breeders' rights examiner are the people who look at your application and consider whether it meets requirements for registration under the Plant Breeders' Rights Act. I'll hand over to Andrew and we can get underway. Okay, thanks, Laura. I do want to stress that it's not going to go into huge detail, but it should give you a good understanding of, of the process, and particularly if you're new to the system, um, should make it make some sense um, to you. So, Anyway, we will we shall uh, move on. Um, first of all, we're going to broadly talk about uh, what intellectual property is. Um, if you don't know, I mean, essentially, it's it's um, uh, protecting ideas, discoveries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, falls under two broad groupings. Uh, there's registered rights, um, which are uh, all maintained or, or administered by IP Australia. Um, uh, there's patents, designs, trademarks, and PBR, plant breeders' rights, um, uh, which is uh, to the, the um, subject of today's presentation. Um, uh, just for your information, there are other webinars about the other three rights um, on our website, um, if you wanted to have a look, um, because they do uh, or can um, overlap with some of the stuff we do in PBR. Um, beyond that, there's unregistered rights like copyright, trade secrets, and circuit layouts. Um, businesses should um, certainly be considering um, the use of IP in their operations. Um, it has uh, many benefits. Um, some are tangible in terms of um, you know, a monetary uh, benefit. Um, uh, that you can see the return of royalties um, and um, you know in, in increased flow of, of revenue. Um, there's also an intangible side to that in that um, depending on how you use your IP, um, you can um, develop networks uh, in growing growing your business. Um, that might be through licensing arrangements and things, and and you've got you then got further benefits of of, of um, you know, building relationships with other uh, industry players. Um, it also enables rights holders to um, uh, defend their variety um, uh, within the within the market uh, and and, and um, yeah, stop people infringing on on their rights. Um, and it's also effectively a valuable marketing marketing tool for promoting uh, integrity and confidence, um, uh, you know, in the business product products. Um, you know, kind of a form of branding really. Um, there, there, there would also be uh, reasons not to register. Uh, first of all, would be the the cost. You know, uh, whether or not um, uh, you're going to make enough money out of the variety to uh, to warrant applying. Um, you may choose to go down um, the avenue of of uh, you know other unregistered rights. Um, uh, and there's always, you know, open source or public varieties as a possibility too. You might have a variety you think is is um, of great value to everyone, and you don't want to make money off it and just release it out for the public good. Um, to give you an idea of how uh, IP can uh, work together, um, you know, we can look at a, a cup of coffee. Um, you know, a plant breeder's right could cover the variety um, of the coffee plant that the company makes, uh, you know, makes its coffee from. Uh, patents could cover uh, how their coffee pod works. A design, a design designs could um, protect the appearance of the coffee pod, and trademarks could protect the logo um, that helps identify the brand of the coffee. Um, 
copyright could protect um, promotional materials like a pamphlet. Um, trade secrets could protect the uh, secret blend of um, coffee beans that uh, might go into a cup of coffee. And circuit layouts um, could protect the uh, layout of the integrated circuit within the coffee machine. Uh, but more importantly, getting back onto on the track, um, today we're going to talk about plant breeders' rights. Um, plant breeders' rights uh, will give a, um, a breeder exclusive rights for up to 20 years uh, in most cases and 25 years uh, in, in the case of trees and some uh, types of vine to reproduce, propagate, uh, reproduce and propagate plant material for commercial purposes um, or license its propagation to the same end, to sell the plant material or license its sale uh, and import import and export the plant material for commercial purposes. Um, and it's really key to remember um, the licensing component of this. Um, the protection is great, but it also gives you an opportunity to grow a business um, and significantly increase revenue streams by licensing arrangements. Um, this leads into the, 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 the next slide, which um, relates to UPOF. So the PBR system um, forms part of a, a, a greater international system um, under the International Convention for the Protection of New, plant as new Varieties of Plants, sorry, um, uh, to which Australia is signatory um, to the 1991 Convention. Um, uh, UPOV is the overarching umbrella organisation that sits in Geneva that, that, um, that helps administer it. Um, through UPOV, um, you have the potential to um, uh, market um, uh, and license your varieties and protect your varieties in, in a whole host of other international countries. Um, the point of UPOV is to try and ha harmonise um, how plant protection works around the world. And as you can see from the map, um, a significant proportion of the world uh, uh, is, is signatory to the UPOV Convention uh, and therefore you have the potential to access these markets, um, albeit with a proviso that you, will, you would have to seek protection in each individual country because each individual, individual country will have its own legislation. Um, but suddenly grows the market from um, you know, 25 million in Australia to billions if you, you, you look at the totality of that. Um, so uh, worthwhile considering. Um, PBR, uh, all sorts of plants can be registered for PBR. Um, it could be things such as shrubs and trees as well as flowering and fruiting and agricultural crops, uh, but certainly not limited to those. Um, algae and fungi can also be protected. Um, and I'm going to have to get a bit, bit technical here. Um, I would imagine most plant people listening will um, will know what a plant variety is. But um, uh, to define a plant variety, um, a plant it's a plant grouping within a single botanic taxon of the lowest known rank, which grouping can be number one defined by the expression of the characteristics resulting from a given genotype or combination of genotypes. Um, number two, distinguished from any other plant grouping by the expression of at least one of the said characteristics and three considered as a unit with regard to suitability for being propagated unchanged. Um, uh, unfortunately I know that's very technical but, but as I say most I think most people that know about plants should know what a, what a, what a variety is um, and it, yeah as I say particularly number three it does need to be reproducible. Um, we have some fairly simplified examples of what varieties might be. Um, species one is obviously um, a group of apples. Um, from that group of apples, we can group them into varieties. Uh, in this case, judging from um, you know, the fruit, fruit colour. Um, we have a, in species two, a, a group of um, very pretty flowers and, and, and much the same in, in that case. Well, in species three is, is lettuce and lettuces can also be um, you know, sub, subcategorized into different varietals um, due to uh, phenotypic um, uh, expressions of, 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 the, of their genotype. Um, 
so um, to determine if a plant variety is registrable, um, it must have a breeder. Uh, the variety must be novel or new. Um, uh, so essentially that means that the variety uh, cannot have been commercially exploited for, um, uh, well, only recently commercially exploited. Um, the, the variety must be distinct in um, key characteristics um, and must be uniform in those characteristics and, and is also, also stable and able to be reproduced. Uh, in, in order to determine novelty, um, novelty is basically determined in PBR by prior sale. Um, so if the plant variety has not been sold um, with the breeder's consent, um, then it's, it's considered novel. Um, if the plant, plant variety has been sold within the last 12 months um, in Australia, it's considered novel. Um, if the plant variety has been sold overseas within the last four years uh, for most plants, it's considered novel. Um, or if the plant is a tree or a vine or certain types of vines, um, uh, it's allowed to have been sold within the last six years and still be considered novel. Um, plant, plant varieties that were sold outside those time frames um, are, are no longer considered novel. So um, these are an important factor to consider um, uh, for two reasons. A, um, you are allowed to sell a plant prior um, to applying for PBR. Um, so it might, might give you a chance to test the market and see, see um, if it's viable as, as a product. Um, but at the same time, you need to remember that these, these um, time frames exist because if you let it run too long, um, the variety will be ineligible. Um, the other ways that we, we look at um, whether a, a plant variety is eligible um, is, is uh, whether it's distinct, uniform and stable. So for this, we'll go back to um, the UPOP convention itself and, um, and uh, define how distinct, uniform and stable work. Um, for distinctness, the variety shall be deemed to be distinct if it is clearly distinguishable from any other variety whose, known, whose, whose existence is a matter of common knowledge at the time of filing the application. Um, so essentially we want something that is, is, is unique. Um, uh, it must be uniform and, um, uh, and, and for, in terms of uniformity, the variety shall be deemed to be uniform if subject to variation that may be expected from, a, from the particular features of its propagation, it is sufficiently uniform in its relevant characteristics. So that specifically relates back to the distinctness. Um, and thirdly, it needs to be stable. So the variety shall be deemed to be stable if its relevant characteristics remain unchanged after re repeated propagation or in the case of a particular cycle of propagation at the end of each cycle, such cycle. So um, you need to be able to produce uh, multiple generations um, that remain stable uh, for it to be considered a variety. Um, in order to apply for PBR, um, we, we, it's a two part process. So the initial, initial part is, is called the part one. Um, now the part one essentially sets out, uh, it's, it's an initial assessment of, of whether or not a plant variety might be eligible. Um, so in the part one application, we look at um, the formality. So we're looking at, at information about the applicant, the agent, the breeder. Uh, we get preliminary information about the variety and its breeding history. Um, uh, we also um, have a proposed varietal name. Now it's important to remember that varieties must have a name as well. Um, we also get a, a nomination of a qualified person, which we'll go into a little bit further down the track. And once the part one is accepted, um, you know, provided it's met all the criteria at this stage, you'll receive provisional protection. So provisional protection, um, it's important to note, um, you can't take infringement action from, but upon grant, if it goes through the second stage of the process, um, you can then retrospectively um, take um, infringement action from it. Um, uh, it's important because it, uh, once you receive provisional protection, you can you can also 
um, notify people that the plant is protected. Um, uh, so a very important step in, in this, if you're new to uh, PBR, is, is the qualified person. Um, so it's really important to know that all applications for plant breeders rights require a QP, or a qualified person. Um, QPs are accredited, expert, accredited experts in particular plant types, um, and they form a very, perform a very important role um, in each application. At, at a minimum, under the legislation, they're required to supervise the growing trial, verify the claims made by the, the breeder and the, and the applicant, and certify the application. Um, QPs may well undertake other, other tasks in, a, in, in an application as well, um, and that's something that would be, it would vary from QP to QP and, and, and application to application. Um, once we've had our application accepted through the part one, um, we then commence the part two of, of the application. Um, so the part two application is, is comprised of a, a growing trial. So the growing trial is where we test um, whether a plant variety is distinct, uniform and stable. Um, from that growing trial, we'll develop um, a wall, the QP uh, in, in conjunction with the applicant and, and um, the Plant Breeders Rights Office will we'll develop a detailed description. Um, the detailed description will then get published um, in the Plant Varieties Journal, which is published four times a year, um, and instigates a public notification period. Um, there's then a requirement for submission of, of further part two documentation, which is certification documents and other things, um, and there's a pay, payment of relevant fees. Um, if all this passes through successfully, um, uh, the plant will be eligible for grant of PBR. Um, so probably the most important component of this is, is the growing trial, where, where we're testing um, the plants, um, whether the plant's distinct, uniform and stable. Um, the applicant and QP, QP in conjunction with the PBR office um, will agree to what varieties uh, to compare to in the trial. Um, but it's really important that it, it must include the varieties of common knowledge that are most similar to the candidate variety. So the way, way we determine whether a variety is different is to compare it to the most similar other known varieties that we can. Um, and if we can distinguish it from those, then, then it must be a new variety, or that, that's, the, that's the methodology. Um, QPs collect data from, from the DUS trial, so the DUS trial is the, is the growing trial um, at different growth stages, um, and develop a description and, and submit this description based off this data. Um, this this, this, this um, trial, uh, and the data is then will then be looked at by uh, uh, an examiner from IP Australia um, to confirm whether or not the claims um, uh, meet the criteria. Um, and if so, the detailed description um, is then um, completed. Um, it's important to note too that in some instances we can use um, a detailed description that was based off um, a, a DUS growing trial uh, overseas and, and, and a relevant report from um, the relevant authority in that country. Um, so this is where this UPOL linkages come in. Um, uh, whether or not a variety will be looked at this way will depend on a number of factors though. Um, the point of the detailed description is to provide detailed information about the variety um, and in particular, um, its distinctiveness, uniformity and stability. Um, this is then published in the Plant Varieties Journal, which is published four times a year, uh, roughly quarterly, not, not quite sometimes. Um, and this is, instigates a six month public notification period. Um, the public notification period is really, really important to know about because um, that's, that's when it's available um, for everyone to see. Um, and it allows the public and interested parties to make comments um, and possibly object about uh, an application. So it could well be that, that um, there's people out there that know about something that, that 
that um, has been missed and, and let us know. So it's a, it's a really good um, checkpoint um, for us to um, correct things. Um, if we do receive comments and, and, you know, and, and formal objections, um, depending on the veracity of, 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 of the comment or the objection, it could lead to retrials um, or rejection of the application. Um, conversely too, it may, may still um, uh, allow the, the, the variety to go through. Um, once uh, the public notification period is over, after the six month period, and there haven't been any comments or objections that have uh, made it um, uh, have to be re-looked at. Um, uh, the, the, the variety is ready for grant or uh, ready to be looked at for grant. So at this stage, um, uh, the remainder of the relevant fees need to be paid uh, and all the part two documentation are certified and submitted. Um, there's a, there can be a number of other minor formalities to be looked at, uh, but once that's all been completed, um, the, the PBR can be granted for the variety and the um, grant protection starts. Broadly speaking, um, timeframes involved um, can, can range quite a bit. Um, so obviously the first thing from an applicant's point of view you need to consider is the prior sale issues. So you need to make sure that you get the part one in, in time. Um, once the part one's received, um, examination um, and acceptance of that uh, application is, is usually within two or three months. Um, sometimes very fast, sometimes it can blow out depending on um, you know, requirements. Once, once the variety is accepted, uh, the growing trial needs to be um, undertaken uh, or an assessment of an overseas um, test report. Um, depending on the plant type and, um, and the circumstances, um, uh, it, this can realistically take between one and six years. Um, some, some plant, plant types are very easy to see rapidly, uh, but some things such as fruit trees, uh, a trial can take four or five years, you know, minimum before we can actually look at it. Um, after that, um, detailed description should, shouldn't should take much longer than three months to um, be published. Um, and uh, the commencement of the public notification period begins, which is six months. Um, grant uh, usually takes between one and month after one, one and two months after that that point. Um, uh, there is another point at this point. Sorry, I'll try and say that again. Poor choice of words. <laughs> there is there is uh, one more step here where where um, that the the grant is then published in the plant varieties journal as well. Um, so that will occur within within three months, um, you know, depending on when the next journal is published. Um, the fees involved from an IP Australia perspective, um, uh, the, the initial application fee uh, is $340, generally $345 for people paying online. Um, you don't have to pay online, but um, you, you do pay a little bit more. Um, so $545 if you were to send a check in or, or some other means. Um, the big fee we have is the examination fee, uh, and that covers um, basically the part two phase, uh, and, and you know cover, covers fees for um, uh, expenses for for examiners to go and visit trials and things, and that's sixteen hundred and ten dollars currently. Um, once that phase go, is successfully passed, then a certificate fee is due, and the certificate fee is essentially the grant fee. Um, and that's 345. Um, and from that point onwards, um, currently the renewal fees are $400 uh, a year online uh, or 450 um, through other means. Um, important to note that these, these fees are actually spread out. Um, they're not something that's all due at once. 
Um, the additional cost that you'll need to consider with a, um, a PBR application um, uh, principally revolve around QP fees and trial costs. Um, these are going to vary quite wildly, uh, you know, from QP to QP, but also because of the plant types and 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 possible other costs around trials. So it's a bit hard to predict what they would be. Um, so in summary, uh, PBR is, is a great way of protecting um, your, your new plant variety. Um, there's two, it's a two-stage process. The initial case uh, in the part one, where we, we determine whether or not it's eligible for, for, for a further look. Um, uh, once you pass this, as I get, as I say, um, you, you'll be eligible for provisional protect, protection. Um, the part two uh, is the next stage, which involves the growing trial um, and the publication of detailed description. Um, you know, and, and once that's successfully crossed and all the relevant documents and fees are paid, it leads to grant. Uh, from grant, you know, you're looking at 20, uh, 20 to 25 years of uh, potential protection. Um, uh, and you know the average time for registration is about uh, two and a half years to achieve this. Um, as I say, though, in some cases it might be longer, uh, depending on the plant type. Once granted, you can use the um, the symbol, the PBR symbol for registration, um, as a, and it essentially warns people that that your your plant variety is is um, uh, PBR registered. Um, it's an Australian right, Australia-wide right, and it's important to consider too that potentially um, it could be uh, used internationally in, in other markets as well. Um, once again, on the proviso that you do consider that you will need, need to apply for the right in other countries. So, if you if you've got a variety or are considering um, looking at PBR, you'll need to, to think about whether or not your variety is new distinct, uniform and stable? Um, is it commercially viable and worthwhile, um, worth the cost of, of um, protecting it? Um, the other thing you'll have to consider down the track is, is, is also um, if you are going to in, in undertake inf enforcement action, you know, is it, is it worth um, uh, the costs of, of, of that enforcement? Um, you know, and have you considered some of the other options? Um, at the end of the of the presentation, we've just basically got a list of, of some of the um, resources that are available online. Um, uh, on our on our internet page, we we have a whole section devoted to uh, PBR. Um, there's also um, a directory for qualified persons. Um, so if you're considering a PBR, as, as I say, we do need you do need to nominate a, a QP. So there's a whole list of um, relevant QPs on there that you can you can um, look through. Um, yeah, and then we have um, so small some generic information about um, IP in general. So um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Thanks, Andrew. So that brings us to the end of our main presentation and onto our Q&A session. If you haven't asked a question yet but want to, please ask now in the question box. We'll give you a few minutes to submit your questions. While we're waiting for some more questions to come through, I'll let you know that we're redesigning our website content to make it easier for you to apply for a PBR. If you'd like to help us by testing our new content, please let us know in the post-webinar survey response. Also, today's session will be recorded, so if there are any particular parts of the presentation you'd like to come back to at your own time, the recording will be on our website soon. And while you're on our website, you can also see that we have a variety of other webinars on IP topics. We're going to take a few minutes now to review the questions and come back to you. Uh, we'll be back shortly. Okay, thank you for all your questions. Um, let's start with one about qualified persons. Um, I guess this is a two-phase one. Can anyone apply or register to be a qualified person? And what is involved? Um, and can a person be both breeder and a QP? Um, yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, look, uh, anyone can certainly apply to be a qualified person. 
um, the process uh, involved uh, is basically submitting an application, pardon me, to, to IP Australia. Um, uh, it'll be assessed based on certain criteria. Um, there is there is a part of the website that describes this. Um, and there's certainly no reason why the breeder can't be the QP. Um, so yes, yes and yes. Okay, our next question is, is there any requirement for overseas DSU reports? Is there a time frame, for example, report within five years? Um, can't give a, a simple answer to this. Um, it kind of depends. Uh, we we do prefer um, overseas test reports to be relatively recent, but there there could be circumstances where um, you know something something beyond five years might be necessary to look at. Um, uh, I can't really tell you much more than that. Um, okay, thanks. Next question is: Must the characteristics for satisfying the distinct requirement to be physical and visible? What about intrinsic functionality characteristics? Um, I suppose there's, there's, there's two, two answers I could, or two stages the answer I could give here. Um, de depending on what, what we're talking about, um, it could be worthwhile looking at the TGs uh, on the UPOV website. So um, this relates to a couple of other questions that have come in too, to some degree. Um, uh, on the UPOV website, for, it, do, it doesn't apply to all plant types, but, but um, we do have technical guidelines we, we work to. Um, and that uh, sets out a, uh, groups of, of characteristics that we, sh that we should look at. Uh, it doesn't we're not limited to that. Um, Intrinsic functionality, I suppose it would depend. Um, certainly disease resistance is something we, we, we do look at on a regular basis. Um, I, I suppose um, it's not entirely um, restricted to physical and visible, um, but it would depend uh, without knowing more detail. Uh, but you know, certainly things like disease resistance are something that we, we would look at as well. Okay, next question. Are the 20 years or 25 years of protect, protection continued from the actual grant of the PBR or retrospectively from the initial point of filing an application once the PBR has been granted? Yeah, so the, so the grant of PBR, um, are 20, 20 or 25 years begin at, at the date of grant. So um, not from uh, the initial filing. Another question here. How do we access what the characteristics criteria is without having to go through an application process? Um, yeah, so this this one um, relates to the previous uh, question um, we had about um, uh, satisfying distinctness. Um, a good place to look, depending on the plant type, is the is the um, uh, UPOV guidelines, the technical guidelines on on the UPOV website. Uh, we we can send this out. Um, to you. Um, so if you're, if the type of plant we, you, that you're looking at um, has a TG, um, that gives you a really, really good um, idea of the sorts of things that we do look at. But it's important to remember that we don't um, just look at what's, up, what's in TGs. Um, uh, the, the purpose of breeding uh, is quite often pushing the limits of, of what's um, already existing uh, out there. So it, it does happen from time to time where we, we have things where the TGs don't cover um, that particular characteristic. And, and, and if it's different in another way, then that's fine as long as we can verify that that's the case. Um, so I suppose, I suppose uh, this would be my, my advice too, is that if you're a plant breeder, um, Observe your plan and have a look, because quite often we'll, we'll get applications where the breeders aren't um, fully sure of how, they know the plan's different, but they don't know how. So, so um, have a look at it in a slightly different eye and then work out, work out where, where, where it is different. Um, and that's perfectly acceptable. Yep. Great. Well, that look, that's all the questions we can get through today. If we didn't get to your questions, we will be in touch within the coming days to respond to you. Thanks so much for explaining plant breeders' rights today, Andrew. 
and for answering the questions. And thanks for everyone attending. We hope you enjoyed the webinar.